This particular video is going to be a little bit different guys. In this particular video what we're going to be doing is we're going to be having a look at all of the mistakes that I've made. Well not all of them, I'm going to talk about a few of them because it's going to take a little while. There's a few. So um, I'm going to talk about probably the most important mistakes and we're going to have a look at some of the things that you might be able to avoid as a process of doing a project if you're going to do a project like that. So this, that is why I'm doing this particular video. It's not to make me look like a numpty or anything else. I don't really care what other people say about me. I, I'm at that age where it doesn't worry me. So essentially, guys, this is for the guys that want to do a project like this, something similar to this, and the things to keep an eye out for, the things that I found along the way, uh, some of the things that I knew, some of the research that I've done, all right? So I hope you find it interesting. Something that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video too, guys, is we're going to talk about the amount of time that I've invested, my own time that I've invested in this boat so far. So if you're going to be looking at doing a project like this, make sure you check it out at the end. Make sure that you go over to the end and have a look at how long it's taken me to do this. Okay? Check it out. Something that I probably need to point out as well is um, make a little disclaimer. Um, I am not a shipwright. I am a uh, trade qualified electronics technician. I've a cabling license and everything else. I've done fiberglass trading through a, a mobile peak called Partech in North Queensland. That was back in 2009. Did molding and fiberglass repairs, fiberglass, fiberglass laminating and stuff like that. But I am not a shipwright. So just be mindful of that, guys. This, the aim of this channel is not to be how to do stuff. This is how I've done it. This is DIY. This is purely about DIY. When I get into the electrical, that's a different story. That is my trade. We are going to get heavily into that. So make sure if you're really into that electrical stuff, you like and subscribe and follow me on that sort of stuff. That is going to be really cool. Um, as you saw from my last video, if you watched the last video, the back deck is partially in. Do that room for fuel tanks and everything else. I've got eskies and everything else up there. All right. But that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is, like I said, is some of the mistakes and some of the uh, lessons learned along the way. So hopefully the idea of that is not to point out a lot of the things that I've done wrong, but more so to hopefully help other people that might, you know, either there's great um, videos out there on YouTube everywhere and uh, lots of really good information, but a lot of it doesn't tell you how to fix your problems or or what to look out for or what not to do and that's what the whole idea of this video today is so it's not going to be any in any particular order guys but what i'm uh, looking at the very last thing i'm going to do i'll give you a bit of a hint it's all about time so i have a really good chat chat about that now one of the things as you can see if we have a look at the back of the boat there now you can see the sun so the heat I haven't got any shade up there at the moment. I've had shade a few times on this boat, but essentially every time I went to put the shade up, we had a cyclone and we had heavy rains or whatever, and it just collapsed the shade on top of the boat, created major problems for me, wet surfaces and everything else, um, and just huge problems. So the issues is that basically of course, sun, hot, hot surfaces, UV sunlight, and everything else, and just major, major problems in the fact that um, what I had to do on many, many occasions was actually wait until the sun passed over and I could work in a shaded area and try and shade that and, and keep it under control. Um, that was a, a process that took a fair bit of getting used to and I just had to work around it. I had to work in small batches, make sure that um, um, I only made up enough resin to uh, for the amount of glass that I was laying down, let that go and then do another small section make sure that I, I did have some problems where uh, essentially when the sun gun goes over it, it, it destroyed it, it absolutely destroyed it really really made a mess I don't have any film over a lot of this sort of stuff but I just want to go over it anyway so what that meant is I had to grind it all back lots and lots of grinding hours and hours of grinding just to get it all back cut it back and do it all again in some, some of those cases um, we worked around it, but uh, that's one of the big things to be really mindful of, guys, is the sun, the heat. The MEKP mixture that you're going to use is it's going to go off very, very quickly, give you no time to work with it or anything else. So, really important. The MEKP, when I was working uh, during the days, 
What I would do is I'd back off the MEKP, but I would always stay within the manufacturer's recommended range. Here in North Queensland, it can get up to 35 degrees Celsius. I think that's up about 90 degrees Fahrenheit or something, so it's pretty hot. So um, what I did is, again, tried to work during the shaded parts of the day, and then on some occasions I would back off my MEKP to 1.5 to 2%. 2% is the maximum, 1.5% is the minimum for the particular MEK. The resin that I was using at the time was vinyl ester resin, so I was very, very, um, I really kept that in mind, really made sure that I didn't go out, out of those um, manufacturer's guidelines. Wet weather and moisture was also a problem because we were working through some cyclone seasons here. The cyclones were giving me a fair bit of grief, a lot of rain, a lot of moisture. Uh, a lot of humidity, so I had to avoid a lot of a lot of those sort of times, um, and you know, just caused delay after delay after delay. It really created some major problems for me. But we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. Oh, problems with the original hull structure, guys. This one's really important. If you're ever going to do a job like this, always check that hull structure first. Make sure that the lines of the hull are spot on because this one wasn't. So what I had is I had a major problem whereby when I did my mould, the mould dropped down in a certain section and that was because the hull did these things. Not real good. So when I, I didn't notice it and it wasn't until I actually put a um, straight edge from chine to chine, if you like, from one side of the boat to the other side of the boat and then measured down every increments of every 50 and 100 millimetres to make sure that the distance from that china from that straight edge was the same everywhere through and I realised that there was an issue so I had to go and actually cut a section of that out and redo it put another section back in fix it up and do it again so always check the if you're going to do a hull extension like this always check the underside of the hull that it is actually level you can see on the outside of the boat on this where it is that this boat was extended at some stage in the past uh, I'll probably I might have a look at doing that as another video separate video or something else but right now Oh, it's not really important for this one. I've got a note here, always make sure the substrate and dry is clean at all times. So that's, I don't know, that's a pretty basic thing when it comes to fiberglassing. Always vacuum down, clean down, vacuum down, and to give it a white of acetone, let it dry, and then, you know, do your thing after that. I've got this in notes here, guys, so um, I'll put these notes up on my, um, on, on the description. That you'll see down below when I write all of that up, so you'll be able to get in there and have a look at it if you if you if you're interested in it. Now, when preparing substrates, always ensure all dust is removed. Now, just be mindful that I've had problems in the past where, when I try to use a blower or something, I just blow the dust off of the top of the substrate. The, the issue that it creates is it can force the dust down into the little little holes. It can force it down into the thermal line, so just be um, aware of that. So that's where it always goes through and always vacuum, always suck it up, always get that dust out and then clean it over with the acetone after that. So that's number one, working within the conditions and the environment that we're trying to adjust to. And these are not ideal conditions, these are really, really bad. Out in the sun, I've got bitumen all over the place when we walk up into the boat, track and dust and dirt into the boat and I've got to clean that off and try and make sure that if I have to, I grind again. Grind, 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 clean, 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 vacuum, acetone, clean it up, and get it ready for lamination. This is a pretty basic sort of a thing. Um, if I had my time again, because of the, we're working on, on the outside here, I would always, before going away for the day or whatever, I would always put the um, wax and styrene in my mix to make sure that it's got a wax coating over the top of it and that will avoid the sort of problems that I was talking about before where I get up into the boat, walk around in the boat and leave all these st sticky footprints. Actually, I've got some here. Let's have a look. So what you'll see is this is a bit of a mess down here. You can see all of this mess here. So that's all where I've been coming up and walking through and making a mess because the, the resins that I used there were unwaxed unwaxed laminating resins so no wax in there everything just stuck to it and made a bit of a mess so I've got to go through and clean that up uh, grind it back clean it up get it right and basically that's where the fuel tanks gonna go so I've got to make that as solid as possible it's already got some really solid uh, stringers and everything else under, underneath it 
uh, as well as that FF360 H60 foam with laminated core over the top of that. So that's going to be super, super strong. All right, tools and grinding discs. Well, just a note here, guys. I have got a note here. Under catalyzing, your MEKP can cause a weaker structure. Now that's clearly written in some of these documents that I've got here, some of the research documents that I found. So again, just be very, very mindful of that. Overcapitalise, capitalising. <laughs> what are we having a financial discussion here? No, we're not. Overcatalyzing can create too much heat, causing a hot mix, cracking and disformation of the, the, of the system. More air can get into it. Oh, very important point. More air can get into it. So that's one of the other issues that we had because of the heat that was being induced into the resin itself, especially the vinyl ester resin. What I found was you would roll it out and get it nice and clean and then air would basically form in underneath those layers again. Um, I'm assuming it's got something to do with the, um, the chemical structure of the resin and how it changes over time as it's curing. And very, very important to note. Uh, as that goes off, if it's getting too hot, if the UV gets into it or whatever, then it could potentially cause some major issues. You need to stay there and watch it and keep rolling it, get that air out, or preferably don't do any resin work in, in those conditions. Tools and the grinding discs. So when it comes to the grinding, I started off with some basic grinders and flat discs and everything else. But over time, what I did find is the Zek disc. There's a Zek disc that um, you can go and buy here in Australia, go and buy it from Bunnings, um, about 30, 40 bucks each for each disc, and they work extremely, extremely well. They last quite a bit of time. Uh, they've got a little bevel corner on them, so you can get up into the corners and the radiuses as well. So they work really, really well. The Zek disc, just remember that one, guys. Really, really cool tool there. Best cutting disc was a segregated diamond disc. So that's the uh, diamond blade cutting disc with the segregations and little slots in it. Uh, when cutting timber, I use the reciprocating saw because those um, slotted diamond discs don't work well on the timber. They just smoke up and burn, and absolutely useless. So I might try and put pictures up next to these, but I, I really didn't want to uh, make this a really highly edited video. I just wanted to make it a sort of informal chat. Uh, your circuit saw, jigsaw and other cutting tools as well, obviously to, depending on where I can get those blades into to get them to get them right. The five glass cloth duet throughout this project. I use chop strand mat woven rovings, typically all 600 grams, except for the chop strand mat, that is the chop strand mat was 250 grams and 450 grams and some 600, so different different layers there. We used woven roving, 600 gram woven rovings. We used double bias and we used biaxial all over the place at different layers. So keeping in mind that whenever I lay the double bias, I've always got a layer of chopped strand mat in between every layer of double bias to help with the shear strength and the structural integrity of that, of that laminate. Now, selections of the resins. Now, it was pretty clear, it was made very, very clear in the Naval Architects design of the structure of this particular boat that vinyl ester resin was to be used. Vinyl ester resin or epoxy resin. I've never used epoxy resin before. I'm not a shipwright by trade. Uh, I'm a DIY guy, that's it. Been in the building and construction industry for well over 30 years and uh, got a pretty good idea to use all the basic tools and everything else. I've done fiberglass training, mold training, doing, um, you know, a basic boat repairs and everything else, got the certificates for it here somewhere and it doesn't really matter. But uh, essentially, really important to to um, to have a really good understanding of what we're using, why we're using it, and um, the resins that we use. Now, really important thing, and what I wanted to talk about here is um, a lot of the research that I've done is I've read a lot of articles where a lot of people play around with the MEKP ratings, essentially to make sure that they've got time to work that resin. And that's fair enough, if you're not working on a structural element and the, the overall uh, strength of it is not that important, then I wouldn't sort of worry too much about it. But in my case, I love to stay within those manufacturer's guidelines. Now, the all of the research that I've done, and it's all in here and all of these papers that I've got here, guys, is, um, you know, there's research that's been done for um, resins that have been mixed with different levels of MEKP to try and work out and try and do some tests 
on the structural integrity of those resins. So what we're looking for is that the resin, once mixed with the MEKP, it must be given enough time to allow the molecular structure to form the change that it needs to change. Now, chains that it needs to build. So what, what that means, I don't know, you probably have to be a chemist to really work that out, but at the end of the day, all we've got to do is, is basically accept the fact that the chemist has said, we've got to do this. So by mixing a, um, MEKP that's a little bit, that's just not enough, then you, give an, you may get an issue where you get saturation issues, where the MEKP just doesn't fill into that resin completely, 100%, all the way around, and saturate that resin. And it also, when we, there's some charts here that I'll have a look at, uh, and I'll put them up on the description as well. These charts will show you the, the, uh, uh, how the structural integrity of the resin changes with different levels of MEKP. It seems to be really good about that 1.75% under the test conditions that were shown here. Uh, really bad at 1% and below 1% and then it gets once above that 1.75 percent gets up to two percent and again it starts to back off and the structural integrity starts to die off so very important just to stay within those those guidelines that the manufacturer is telling you the other importance to know is what are the difference in relation to the structural integrity of the different resins so i've got again some notes here um, now Probably the most important thing to, to realize here is the vinyl ester resin that I'm using here is a styrene modified epoxy resin. So uh, let's say, just for example, you know, let's look at that as saying, well, it's kind of a, an epoxy base. So it's, it's still got that strength and characteristics of certain epoxy, but it's not at that level of epoxy. So with the vinyl ester resin, we've got greater chemical bonding. We've got less chance of delamination. So it can be a little bit more lenient there when it comes to the delamination, but always be mindful of being very, very clean. Keep everything absolutely spot on. You get a stronger structure, greater impact resistance, greater fatigue resistance, uh, greater chemical resistance. So uh, more chemical resistance to fuels and oils and spills and things like that. You use it in a fuel tank. I've checked with the manufacturer that supplies my vinyl ester resin. They've said it's perfectly fine to use in my petrol fuel tanks. If that's the way I'm going to go. Now, greater water resistance as well. So anywhere below the water line is where vinyl ester resin is going to go for me. Remembering this boat stays on the water all the time. Uh, big red note here. Um, vinyl ester resin, a styrene modified epoxy resin system with closed links. Closed links. What does that mean? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a chemist, so. I, have, I don't really know. When you have a look at the pictures, I do have the pictures here. When you have a look at the pictures, it sort of, it does show you what the closed links mean. I've got highlights there and all that fancy stuff so that I can, I can remember, look at these things. So I'm getting older now. My memory's not as good as it used to be. So, you know, nah, a little bit of a cheat sheet here and there doesn't matter, does it? Pretty handy, really. So, the other thing, uh, the other thing is that the problems that I ran into is like I talked about the environment, I talked about the temperature, I talked about humidity, rain, UV, sunlight, heat, um, but walking in and out of the boat all the time. I had some major problems, especially when I was using a laminating resin where the surface of the, uh, the resins would stay sticky, or the laminate would stay sticky. So when I got into the boat, it would drag all of the rubbish from outside into the boat and it would stick to the surface. What that meant was I was I'd have to grind it down again get in there, grind it down, hit it with some acetone, get it as clean as I possibly could before laying that next layer, next layer of my laminate. So really important is um, the environment. I know some shipbuilders or boat builders, as we say, shipwrights, use um, thermal control, controls the heat and the humidity and everything else and gives the perfect, that's it, climatic conditions for the resin being used. So, you know, I don't have that option here. I don't have those fancy tools and that fancy big shed or anything else that I can use, so I'm pretty much stuck with what I've got. Um, do not over and under catalyze MEKP, so we've talked about that a little bit. Um, now, there were times where I'd look up and I'd see a blue sky, absolutely blue sky, beautiful blue sky, no problems there, sweet, let's start doing some laminating or whatever, or let's start making up some cover seal or some bog, and then all of a sudden, showers had come across. So I had to make up some hot resins in areas that were not 
structural elements and I basically too much MEKP so the problem that, that created was too much heat within the curing product creating cracks and problems so not a good thing again grind back clean it all up and redo it when the weather was a little bit better and I had more time so very very important that aspect of it very very important um, I have done videos on that sort of stuff in the past I will do some some more as well about those structural glass glasses because I'm doing another boat very very important I'm doing another boat I've got a smaller boat sitting at home whole idea was a smaller boat was to be a tender for this boat so I could go out to the reefs and everything else have a tender behind this and run around the reefs in the small boat so that's coming that's another project that I've got to do it was a forward cab uh, and I've cut that cab off I've cut it all back and I'm going to turn it into a uh, basically a rear console or a center console or something like that all right guys um, something else that I did get pulled up on by uh, somebody on the on the page was uh, wearing PPE very very important guys should always wear your PPE especially when grinding and everything else now I've been in the construction industry like I said before for well over 30 years and silicosis is a big thing that gets talked about a lot within our swims and our JSEAs and our safety documents and everything else we must use or oh, here's a vacuum cleaner here that's a HEPA filter vacuum cleaner that we have to use typically what we would do is grinding through concrete and everything or cutting into concrete we would have one guy doing the cutting, another guy standing there with the vacuum cleaner sucking all the dust out and special filters and everything else, face masks and all the rest of it to avoid getting any sort of silicosis. And silicosis comes from the sand particles and dust particles that are created within the concrete and in fiberglass because fiberglass is made up of glass. So just be very mindful of that, always wear your proper PPE. Now. The rules have changed here in Australia a little bit with regards to silicosis and the rules surrounding the silicosis and the dangers with it. They've relaxed it a little bit more, but do your research, guys. If you really, really, you need to keep an eye on your health and just be mindful of that, eh? Because the last thing you want to do is is have problems later on in life when your lungs start to fill up with this rubbish and you start can't breathe anymore and start running into problems. Well, that's a very basic overview for now anyway, guys. I hope you found that a little bit interesting. Um, just remember, MEKP levels are very important. Stay out of the sunlight. Try and control the environment in which you're working in. Uh, keep everything clean. Use a rag to clean everything down. Use a white rag too because sometimes you can't see the particles of dust and everything else within the coloured rags. So you need to be able to make sure that you can uh, see any of the dust or anything that's coming out of that and get it spot on. Hey, something that I need to add to all of that too is um, what I didn't talk about is the time that it's taken me to do all of this. So if I uh, go back through what I've done so far, um, this boat has been sitting here for 12 months doing this work. Now I've been able, I work full time, um, so I've been able to come down typically after hours, on the weekends, um, pretty much every afternoon after work. And if I had to put a number on the labour, I haven't, unfortunately I wasn't smart enough to do his time sheets and everything else and I actually log that time. But if I actually had to work out how long it's taken me to get to the point that I'm at now, I've done some calculations and I would say that we're up around the 750 hours. Alright, so let's put that in dollar terms for a second. If you were paying somebody $150 an hour, $100, let us do it nice and easy, 100 bucks an hour. 75, $750 hours, 75 bucks an hour is what, 75,000 bucks. That's just an hour labour to get to this point. I understand that a shipwright would probably be able to do it in half time, third time, whatever. But your time's not free. Just, you know, I've heard people say, oh yeah, 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 your time's free. But it's not. Your time's important. While you're here on the boat, while I'm here on the boat, I'm not with my family, I'm not doing other things, I'm not doing business things. So, um, it's not free. So we've got to put, allocate something to that time. The other thing is obviously the materials. I haven't gone through all my materials yet. Uh, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be cheap. There's a lot of thermalite in here. There's a lot of vinyl ester resins and, and structural glass and everything else. So that's another thing to take into consideration. But we'll have a look at that maybe sometime down the track. Maybe when we finish the project. I am doing a zero to 100% film as well. So that's going to be about the whole project done from start to finish. All of the information is going to be in there. All of the, all of the 
materials that I've used, the resins, all of that kind of stuff, it's all going to be detailed in that uh, video. So it's going to be very, very informative. Hope you enjoy that one. Well, there you go. That'll do for now anyway, guys. Hope you found that a little bit interesting. And uh, uh, the next video I'm going to be doing is probably going to be more about the future projects. I'm mean, learning TIG welding as well. I'm absolutely shit at that. I'm terrible at that. Absolutely shocking. TIG welding is a new thing to me. I did welding in my first year of my apprenticeship. That was back in the 80s, guys, so you do the calculations. Uh, and then we're going to start on that smaller boat. Little bit by little bit, but this boat's got to get finished first. So there's some of the things that have come. Oh, and ELV Electronics. So I've gutted this whole boat as far as the wiring is concerned. All the wiring has been removed. So that is my trade. I am an electronics technician by trade. I've got open unrestricted cabling license here in Australia. I can do whatever I damn well like. So I'm going to be doing that all the way through this boat. I'm going to be doing all the wiring, all the electronics, and getting it all up to scratch. So something to look forward to. All right, guys. Thanks, eh? Hope you enjoyed it.